Welcome to our quarterly Global Health Compassion Rounds, jointly convened by the World Health Organization's Global Learning Laboratory for Quality Universal Health Coverage, and the uh, focus area for compassion and ethics face at the Task Force for Global Health. My name is David Addis, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the webinar. For the past three years, the Global Health Compassion Rounds has brought together people working in global health to explore the role of compassion in their lives and their work. In today's rounds, we'll be reflecting upon what has been shared over these three years, highlighting cross-cutting themes and hearing from distinguished panelists who will no doubt challenge us and help us discern along with you all how to deepen this exploration and carry it forward. To facilitate our rounds today, I'd like to now introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Shams Syed at the World Health Organization. Shams? Thank you so much, um, David, and uh, welcome to all colleagues uh, from across the world in this um, special Global Health Compassion Rounds. It's a, a real opportunity, as David has highlighted, to look back at a, a, at a special journey and to think about where we can take this forward from this point onwards. Um, and really um, thinking back to the special moments that we have had over the last three years, um, we are very fortunate to have a, a message from our Director General, um, Dr. Tedros, to give us um, a starting point for our discussions today. So um, if, if I could ask, for the message from Dr. Tedros, uh, our Director General at the World Health Organization to be played. Thank you. Dear colleagues and friends, throughout history, compassion has been a driving force in improvements to health, the desire to alleviate suffering and improve the lives of our fellow humans. Three years ago, I asked that we explore the role of compassion in global health in terms of the quality and availability of health services, the experience of patients, and the welfare of health workers. I'm delighted that since then, the Global Health Compassion Rounds has brought together a community of health professionals and advocates from around the world to explore the links between compassion and quality of care, faith, leadership, palliative care, and more. I look forward to learning about what actions we can take to foster and harness compassion to drive access to quality health services and improved health outcomes. I thank the Task Force for Global Health and my colleagues at WHO for your collaboration in this important project. And I look forward to our continued partnership for a healthier, safer, fairer, and more compassionate world. I thank you. So Dr. Tedros has clearly articulated a bit of a challenge for us in looking backwards and to look forwards. Um, and the synthesis that has been developed of the Global Health Compassion Rounds is a really important resource for us to consider very carefully as we move forward. So with that, allow me to hand back to my colleague, uh, David. David. Thank you very much, Shams. Uh, to set the stage for our discussions today, I'd like to highlight some of the central themes that emerged in previous rounds. You can see six of these slides, six of these themes highlighted on this uh, slide. Uh, Hallie Antone, our communication specialist, has reviewed all of the reports from the previous rounds and developed uh, this summary. The first is motivation. Compassion is a source of motivation for many, perhaps most of us working in the field of global health. It's the fuel that supports the day-to-day -day work. Connection and community. In global health, we recognize the extent to which our lives are deeply intertwined. And we know that the solutions to many challenges often lie within the communities themselves. Central themes of respect and dignity emerged repeatedly throughout the rounds. Another recurring theme was the need to think in terms of systems 
we are much better able to act compassionately if we're supported by the systems in which we live and work. Another theme was power. Many of our panelists highlighted the inequitable power arrangements in society and the global health, and also in global health. And these power arrangements block compassion, they perpetuate inequities, and they need to be dismantled. A final theme that emerged was self-compassion and self-care. We were reminded repeatedly of the importance of self-compassion and self-care, which support our ability to act with compassion towards others. I'd like now to briefly focus on key themes or lessons from each of these rounds. If I can have the next slide. Five of these rounds address specific diseases or areas of global health. Next slide, please. In the rounds on COVID-19, which was soon after the pandemic began, it was already clear that COVID would exacerbate existing global health inequities. Tanya Wood, one of our panelists, highlighted the power of compassion to shine a light on inequalities that drive vulnerability. Next slide, please. The rounds on water, sanitation, and hygiene described WASH as an expression of compassion. Since WASH addresses basic human needs, it alleviates suffering and it promotes human flourishing. Stephanie Ogden, one of our panelists said it well, a latrine is not just a tool for public health. It's also a tool that allows people to feel that privacy, dignity, and safety are options. Next slide, please. We then turned our attention to neglected tropical diseases or NTDs. NTDs are diseases of poverty and neglect and the NTD community prides itself on being pro-poor. Matthias Duck reminded us that true compassion arises from a sense of solidarity, and that while our work may be pro-poor, we can sometimes slip into an attitude of pity rather than compassion. Matthias said that we need to examine our hearts to develop and sustain a mature compassion rooted in equality and solidarity. Next slide, please. Our rounds with colleagues in, in respectful and maternal new, newborn, respectful maternal and newborn care highlighted the many ways that they've operationalized compassion with a focus on human rights, policies, and healthcare practices. They emphasize that a commitment to human dignity, treating people with respect, is fundamental both for respectful maternal and newborn care and for compassion. Next slide. In our final rounds in this series on specific diseases or global health areas focused on palliative care. And it affirmed that compassion is the bedrock of palliative care. Rob Jones reminded us that compassion requires mutual recognition and connection. Emmanuel Uyurika noted that compassion is a constructive response to suffering. It enhances treatment outcomes and fosters human dignity. He highlighted the role of compassion in improving our confidence to improve the quality of life of others. Next slide, please. We had three additional rounds that focused on human aspects of compassion. Next slide. In our rounds on leadership, Sham Syed noted how compassionate leadership is essential for quality healthcare. Compassionate leadership counts at all levels, and ultimately it saves lives. Laura Berland emphasized the need to build compassionate communities that create cultures of safety, connection, and belonging. Next slide, please. We also explored the role of religious faith that for many in the field helps to nurture and sustain compassion and serves as a motivation for compassionate action. Gilbert Buckle described this well, noting that a mature faith fosters humility and an appreciation for human dignity and the desire to treat others 
as we would like to be treated ourselves. Next slide. In our rounds in June of this year, our panelists shared powerful personal stories of compassion in global health. Two themes that emerged from these stories are shown here. Abraham Lino highlighted the importance of communicating compassion. In his clinic, patients are greeted and told, you have a right to be here. You are welcome here. Nouville Wijirasakura also emphasized the need for self-compassion. Next slide. We had two final rounds on translating the science of compassion into action. Next slide, please. One focus specifically on the essential role of compassion for quality health services, appoint Dr. Tedros, the Director General of Global Health of the World Health Organization, has made repeatedly. And we just heard from him a few minutes ago, his commitment to this. Stephen Tresiak reviewed the many powerful benefits of compassion, not only for patients, but also for those who care for them in these rounds. Next slide. And our final rounds address the challenge of measuring compassion. In global health, what gets done is what is measured. So what gets measured gets done. To create compassionate health systems, we need good metrics. Shane Sinclair reminded us of the need to develop and validate metrics that have relevance in different contexts. Next slide, please. I'm happy to announce that Dr. Sinclair and his team have now developed a toolbox to guide the selection and use of compassion measures in healthcare settings. The toolbox describes the measures from the perspectives of patients, providers, and health systems. It also guides you to the most appropriate measures for your setting. Before releasing the toolbox for broad use though, we need your feedback to fine tune it and to make it as useful as possible. If you'd be willing to take a look at the toolbox and provide us feedback, we'd be very grateful. Uh, for more information, uh, please send an email to compassionresearchlab at gmail.com. You can see this address at the bottom of the slide and we'll also post it uh, in the chat. Next slide, please. <clears throat> To try to summarize, um, the intent of the Global Health Compassion Rounds has been to share experiences, challenge ideas, and spark thinking on compassion and global health. Our wise and insightful panelists have helped us understand that compassion is integral to the global health enterprise and to see how compassion is manifested across the spectrum of global health activities. It's also clear that we have much yet to learn and much to do. Where does our exploration of compassion and global health lead us now? Our panelists today will challenge us to consider where we must go if we were to be faithful to the claims of compassion. I'd like to turn it back over to you, Shams, to introduce our panelists and continue the uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, David, and really, um, a complex journey that you've somehow managed to summarize so beautifully. Um, I'd also encourage colleagues uh, who haven't seen the synthesis report uh, to take a look at the report because it gives more details on some of the points that David um, outlined um, so nicely for us. But today our focus is to listen to colleagues who will reflect on what we have been able to achieve in these three years. And for that, I'll be turning to a distinguished panel, starting with Sharmeen Akhtar Zahan. And Dr. Zahan is a medical doctor and public health professional based in, in Bangladesh, with almost 20 years experience at local and international levels. And she currently serves as a chief operating officer at the Institute for Developing Science and Health Initiatives in Dhaka. Um, she has a wide body of experience and in the interests of time, I won't go into all of the details, 
but just to highlight that she has worked very closely with BRAC. She has had uh, opportunities to feed into global level dialogues, for example, with Gavi. So really looking forward to uh, Sharmin uh, Zahan's perspectives. Uh, Sharmin, uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shams, for your generous introduction. And I'm so much humbled to be included in this special Global Health Round, Compassion Round. Um, let me share a bit on my orientation with compassion, which is through my upbringing in a middle-class family in Bangladesh that was driven by strong family values. And I had the opportunity to learn and cultivate the culture of compassion within my own cultural context. However, as a healthcare worker, it was Global Health Compassion Round that made me understand that compassion can be a tool to improve the healthcare system and outcomes. And it is a virtue that is very much needed for personal development for healthcare professional like me and all, including the ones who are in the leadership role. In my professional journey, particularly during the pandemic, often I felt very lonely, helpless and hopeless as well, and found this Global Health Compassion Round is a great community where I can learn and stay energized. To be frank, I loved all of David's words and the purpose perspectives in the session. The, all the topics I found relevant and Shams, your effort in connection with compassion and quality healthcare, all those were actually the glue for me to be attached with the Global Health Compassion Rounds. Equally, I was deeply moved with the personal sharing from the panelists, the challenges they have mentioned, their hopes and aspirations, all basically touched my heart and empowered me tremendously and mostly resonated with my own view. And I took the opportunity to be present each time with a strong desire to contribute with my capacity, with the learnings, uh, from the Global Health Compassion Rounds, no matter I'm a tiny dot in the global health, uh, past global health ocean. And not the least, through the Global Health Compassion Round, I was able to grow my further interest on religion, spirituality, and health. Oh. I feel the synthesis report, Global Health Compassion Round, has made is very comprehensive and rightly identified the themes David just mentioned. And all the themes are interconnected and all these themes sparse further exploration on how to make uh, a system change on the ground. The lessons from the Global Health Compassion Round has helped me to validate my own circumstances both at the individual and at the institutional level. I have found whenever I have acted with compassion that enabled me to understand more about the issues and to solve the problems and provided a sense of shared humanity. However, to sustain the trust, to hold the compassion moment was a big challenge for me. As a woman in a resource constrained patriarchal society with a huge colonial influence, which has manifested upon us through a huge trauma in our lives, thinking of compassion, compassionate community often seemed uh, like thinking of a utopic world. And I feel that's what demands the system alignment, respect and dignity, need for compassionate leadership and self-care. All are heavily discussed in the 
Global Health Compassion Round. With this short realm of time, I can't mention uh, everything, but just to share from Laura Berland, I think it was on Global Health Compassion Round 5. Um, Laura emphasized the necessity of building the compassionate communities of support and the organizations that can promote the cultures of compassion. And David also, with David, I will also uh, echo with Laura that cultures of safety, connection, and belonging. If we could actually uh, could uh, develop the organizations of the community, we can actually transform the healthcare sector and quality will flourish automatically. Lastly, I believe the last three years of Global Health Compassion Round is a huge success to create awareness and compassion in global health. And now, Global Health Compassion Round can strive further to use the power of compassion to remove some other root causes that hinders the quality of care in any context. And to relate at personal level, sadly, my overall experience as a woman in global health was not so much smooth. It was impacted by many, many factors. And I would like to mention only one, that is the experience of existing gender inequality for women healthcare workers. It really makes me angry and frustrated when this is the fact that globally, women healthcare workers cover 70% of the health and social care worker, 90% of the nursing and midwifery positions are uh, filled up by women, but still 25% of them are actually in the leadership position. And one in three healthcare workers, uh, three women healthcare workers are victims of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, both at work, in the community and in their family. So I feel to share my personal expectation from Global Health Compassion Rounds in future to explore on role of compassion in addressing this uh, existing gender inequality in health, women healthcare workers. And I feel this is one of the need of our time, a priority, a burning issue that many other actors are also working with. With this, I'd like to um, end here. Thank you. Th thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sharmin, for those really um, important points. And you covered a whole range of issues. And we'll come back to uh, further discussions, but allow me to move forwards with uh, Professor Liz Grant, a friend and colleague from the University of Edinburgh. And she's a professor of global health and development uh, and the director of the university's Global Health Academy. Uh, and Liz actually co-directs the university-wide Global Compassion Initiative on the science and practice of compassion. So she's known in the arena of, of, of compassion um, and she is a fellow of the Royal College, uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh as well. Um, importantly, she's linked up with the Scottish Government um, and the NHS Global Citizenship Board and on the steering group for health information for all. Uh, Liz, um, the, the floor is yours, over to you. Thank you so much. And it's it's wonderful to reflect. It's wonderful just to be part of a community who believe in compassion because, because compassion is in our DNA. It, it's what allows us to thrive. Compassion has kept, kept humanity surviving for all of these years. And we forget that sometimes. And I think the global rounds really helped us to remember that we're not talking about something unreachable or unattainable. We're actually talking about something that's in our hearts, in our minds, or that should be, and that's possible to nurture. 
compassion also in the global rounds showed us that it's really about doing something radical. It's about turning the world upside down. And as the world that we're in at the minute, with its tensions, with its stress, with the anxiety, with the multiple and complex problems, a, a, a triple planetary crisis with biodiversity loss, with climate crisis, with pollution, you know, our triple economic and social and emotional crisis that's happening and the sense of a, a world coming apart. Compassion is so essential. One of the things that I learned and reflected on during these last um, years thinking about compassion was that it has a, a power to show us how to move from one place to another. Um, it, it enables us to see the world differently. It was C.S. Lewis when he was talking about his own faith. Um, it, he talked about it, he said, compared it to the sun, he said, I, I not only see the sun, I see everything through the sun. And in a way, I think compassion does that. We not only see compassionate acts and we can witness compassion, and actually we also can witness when there's no compassion, but when we see the world through compassion, we feel differently, we act differently, we do things differently. The world doesn't change. We in, are unable to approach the world differently. And I think this is the key thing that, you know, and for me, so much part of my learning. I reflected on the things where we're, where we have problems and one of the big areas is particularly in global health, but right across is losing a vision of what could be. We've been doing a lot of work around the sustainable development goals and compassion. And that's been one of the findings that somehow we've, we've lost the vision, um, a vision of a world that is transformed, that is healed. Compassion can help us see that world differently again. It can bring us back to see people. We've become, things have become lost in translation as we have invested in the mechanisms, the opera, operationalized, the, the doings of global health, the, the systems that keep things going. Sometimes we have lost the faces of those who are suffering. And we've been reminded already that compassion is about being with those who are suffering. It's about being in suffering, with suffering, working through suffering. It's noticing, as Monica Warline and Jane Dustin talks about, it's noticing suffering, it's interpreting it, it's feeling into it, and it's taking action to alleviate suffering in order to have flourishing. So we're moving from being almost lost in translation to beginning to see those human, the human face. And we've sometimes lost sight of the long game. We've sometimes lost sight of the fact that we can't change the world overnight. We can't, a single act of kindness brings about change, but it also needs to be sustained. It needs, we need to be committed in the long game. And that's one of the things that each of the talks gave us, that sense of being committed, of thinking of a future, of the patience that compassion requires. Because as we even think of the, the goals of global health, the goals, the sustainable development goals, they're not an end in themselves. They're just a beginning as well. They're putting us to a world, towards a world, a world that is flourishing, a world that changes. So how do we allow compassion to help us navigate complexity? How do we allow compassion to give us the enduring social contract with others, to see others as the Scottish poet Robbie Byrne says, to see others as ourselves, to see ourselves with others, to be able to believe in a common humanity, to co-create caring together, because it's not about doing things to people, it's being together, the, the calm part of compassion with people together. It's also about curating, 
diversity. And the talks throughout the last um, number of sessions really gave us a glimpse of how to see the diversity, but to see diversity in a way that shows us and amplifies the beauty of each other is not about separateness, it's about togetherness with difference. Compassion gives us that element, gives us that technique, gives us that way of looking. Compassion changes who we are. And I'd like to just finish with a, a thought. And I, I, you know, in the, um, the, the Christian faith, like many faiths, we're moving towards celebration, we're moving towards um, rituals and rites and, and holiday season, sacred times. And some of you will be familiar with the story of St. Nicholas, um, who has morphed somehow into Santa Claus. Yesterday, 19th of December, St. Nicholas was celebrated in the Eastern Orthodox community, celebrated in the Western community on the 6th of December. St. Nicholas was the Bishop of Myra. He died in 343. And the reason I'm telling the story, because I think it illustrates something about compassion, about our learning, is that he became a, a, a saint of so many different people. Why? Because he was gracious and kind and there was a generosity. And there's a number of stories about him. One story, the story of him watching a family, a father, who, the, the mother had died, father had three young daughters. The father had no diary and it was a time when they needed a diary for the for each girl each young woman to be married and the story goes that saint nicholas gave each time this uh, the diary a bag of gold secretly put it into the house so that the young woman if they were not sold into slavery which would have been the alternative at that time and for me, that gave me an es it really picked up an essence of things that have come through the compassion initiative and the compassion thinking throughout. And it's about taking practical action in the here and now, even with things that we're not sure about, in order to change the system. It's about doing things that are in our capability, but thinking big, making changes for others. It's about being visionary to identify that in the gift of giving and the gift of receiving, we change lives. So I just wanted to reflect on that, but also to reflect on that greater peace that we have together over these talks that have brought us together and recognize that compassion has changed the way we see the world. So thank you, Shams. Uh, Liz, thank you so much. And uh, as always, you'll you'll bring um, a certain emotional uh, aspect to all of what we do, and this is this is key. And the long game that you highlight is something that we'll come back to in the discussion. Just to keep the pace and the time, we'll move now um, across continents to Isha Ray Chowdhury uh, and Dr. Isha Ray Chowdhury's introduction to compassion uh, tasks in health began in her childhood when she accompanied her mother who volunteered for a vulnerable woman and children's healthcare center in New Delhi, India, and established, and that was established by the Sarvadaya Holistic Movement for Community Development of Mahatma Gandhi. So uh, Isha has been a, a regular uh, attender at the Global Health Compassion Rounds, and um, uh, my colleagues at the uh, at FACE, and uh, we, we, we thought it would be important to hear from her perspective, given that she's been involved in the Global Learning Laboratory, as well as the Global Patient Safety Network. So Isha, um, over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, that's, that's good. Uh, first of all, greetings, everyone, and uh, thank you, a very big thank you to the focus area for compassion and ethics and the global learning uh, quality, for quality of the WHO for this wonderful participation opportunity in this very inspiring forum. Uh, I can keep on talking about this subject forever. And I'm so sad that Shams 
really wanted me to speak from the heart and not use the PowerPoint slides because my heart is always overflowing when I'm on this topic. So I would, with your kind permission, uh, like to take a look at some of my notes to be within the time that has been scheduled for us to share our experiences. Following the uh, inspiring goals of the global learnings uh, ethic, I would like to spark some ideas on both compassion and quality and challenge some traditional norms and assumptions about our thinking on the subject. I would like to do that based on my experiences as an equity analyst, where I've had the privilege of working on Canada's international development projects, partnering with multilateral initiatives of the United Nations and the OECD, and translating those insights, those valuable insights of the global context of equity for understanding and reflecting on experiences that I have as a patient, family member, and a member of community here in Canada. It is interesting to observe that uh, we talk about the global local interface, but it is such a big reality in lives of the diverse, so-called diverse community members because sometimes the con context of their experience really represent the LMIC, whatever we call the lower and the middle income countries, variations and sufferings and vulnerabilities. Yet they are also citizens of a high income country. So the interface is very stark, very real. Uh, I would like to mention here one of the things that the uh, ideas, my ideas about this whole equity perspective emerged from this, uh, you know, our suggestion to see a connection between the dots, between the brilliant dots of the past three years of the global health round, and also reflect on uh, charting a path forward. I think the equity context not only does provide a connecting thread of equity in all the themes that we have discussed and majorly the key themes, but they also represent a vibrant roadmap for future rounds for leading us from the future. Uh, concern about sustainable development, some of the things that Liz mentioned, some of the things that Shamin has mentioned, gender equity, uh, sustainable approach to biodiversity, eco, -just, eco justice, and most importantly, human rights. Some of the contexts that we can still talk about to, to understand compassion and quality of health at a deeper level, particularly focusing on their intersections. So, one of the points I note here is that the, for this understanding the interactions, I would like us to note two major points. Are you, I don't know, I get the window saying that unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Oh, okay. Please go ahead. All right. Two points that I note in my analysis of the whole key themes are recognition of uh, a serious recognition of the need for understanding that there are nuances in the concept of compassion. That is one. And the second one is recognition of the critical need for understanding that patients, family, 
community, which has become a typical feature of all our health equity discourse, they are not, and I repeat, they are not a homogeneous or a monolithic group or a population. Let us please remember that. So that brings me to the whole point about the patient agency. We seldom talk about the agency aspect of a patient's reaction to the marginalization or uh, vulnerabilities of the population, but that is critically important for us. And that does become very clear within the equity lens. So all that I'm saying is that I see the dots uh, very beautifully connected, the brilliant dots of the past three years of rounds through a common core of equity, through sharing of our diverse experiences locally and globally, through our collective vision for equity and equitable understanding of our contexts, and finally to transform the system into an inclusive system, into an inclusive structure where all the diversities are really acknowledged as part of our norm. So the key word in my mind here is norm. And I am, I, I, I sincerely hope that we would be speaking about the role of the structural, uh, what should I say, structural realities in all our discourses about compassion and quality of health, of course. Uh, going back to the nuances in compassion, I would like to mention that, for example, in India, compassion is considered as a service to prana, another Sanskrit word, life force that it exists in all living beings, all. In that sort of a spiritual context of compassion, there is no othering. It is not a reactive action for a suffering, but it is an innate human duty. In terms of education, I would think that that becomes an awareness raising insight for all healthcare professionals, physicians, as well as patients, of course. So another Sanskrit word that really reflects this whole focus on this humanity, the collective humanity, humanity rather than putting it into separation of uh, the sufferers and me, the person who's going to be compassionate towards the people who are suffering. It, and that concept is the Shiva concept, another Sanskrit word. So this service, Shiva, we become a part of a same humanity where the actor of compassion, as well as the recipient who receives the compassion, are equally privileged to be in that process. So that's another very critical reality for us to understand in terms of our discourse on the nuances in compassion, I feel, as a patient. And the second one that I already mentioned is patient agency. It is, as a patient myself, or a fa patient family, or a member of the community of the so-called BIPOC community in Canada, at least, the Black, the Indigenous, the persons of color. I am assigned to a subgroup of population. It is not enough for us to say all patients, patients and families and communities. We keep referring to them again, as I said, as a monolithic group, as a homogeneous group. And we forget the impact of these traits of 
subgrouping, for lack of a better word, and their engagement with the system. In our discussions at the global, uh, at the WHO's global learning repository, we have we continue to talk about, and I'm delighted that we have done patient engagement. We have accepted that patient engagement as part of the stakeholder engagement as an important part of quality planning and understanding quality of the mm -hmm. system. Please understand that this engagement approach also is very dependent on the varieties of context, like the nuances and compassion. These are contextualized by not only historical context, I think Dr. Uh, Sharmin mentioned the colonial context, the gender inequities, and we can go on and on with all the you know, determinants and upstream factors that divide us. I mean, my identities, I sometimes feel that yes, I am a mother, yes, I am a, a community member, yes, I'm a patient, yes, I'm a, a equity analyst. And then I could have been a physician, but I'm not a physician, I'm a social scientist. So in my identity, all these various aspects coexist within my identity as a person. And then to talk about me just as a minority patient, to what extent does that description uh, really is fair for understanding whoever is on the lying on the bed, for, uh, critically ill, or in a primary uh, healthcare, uh, you know, uh, in a doctor's office for consultation? Isha, Everything... I'm going to have to ask you to just maybe just wrap up, just to give others. Yes, yes. So I, I, I would just like to end. Uh, I think I would have, I'm sorry, this is why Shams, I needed my PowerPoint, believe me, next time, if there is a next time. I must, I, I cannot let uh, myself go without this. Uh, to conclude, as an avid follower of NASA, National Academic, uh, I think National Administration of Space, is it National Academy of Space Administration? Deep space exploration. I find the ever expanding quest for knowledge remarkably spiritual. I'm connecting the science with the ethics here, kindly note that. NASA's, and now I'm going to just relate it to our charting a path forward for the rounds. NASA's first telescope for deep space exploration, the Hubble, captured extraordinary images of stars, planets, and galaxies, which then provided guidance to its successor, the current one, the web, to explore further their complex patterns and interactions and advance deeper our knowledge about the deep space. I sincerely hope as a frequent attendee of the Global Rounds, it is my sincere hope that in a similar fashion, through connecting the themes of the rounds and recognition of these new insights to, uh, that I have already mentioned, the nuances in compassion and the patient agency, we will chart a path forward for further rounds, illuminating the, within the equity lens and within the insights of emerging new paradigms of, I just read in the Lancet, exposomic paradigm, exposomic insights of the paradigm as also of that eco-justice and human rights, which I mentioned right in the beginning. Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry that I ran out of time, but this is why I wanted my, PowerPoint slides. Sometimes the PowerPoint slides can manifest my heart also. Isha, thank you so much for that. And um, you spoke from the heart, which is, I think, what colleagues will cherish um, very much. Um, thank you for that. And thank you for being such a strong advocate for the equity aspect of our, all of our work. I now turn to um, Thupten Jinpa, 
who is a former Tibetan monk who holds the Gashe Alaram degree, as well as a BA in philosophy and a PhD in religious studies, both from Cambridge University. And since 1985, he has been the principal English translator to His Highness the Dalai Lama and has in this capacity traveled extensively with him and has translated and edited numerous books by the Dalai Lama, including the New York Times bestsellers Ethics for the New Millennium and The Art of Happiness and Towards a True Kinship of Faiths, How the World Religions Can Come Together. So uh, Jinpa's own publications include works in Tibetan, English translations of classical Tibetan texts and, and books, uh, including A Fearless Heart, How the Courage to be Compassionate Can Transform Our Lives. And Jinpa is the main author of the Compassion Cultivation Training. Um, and uh, I am gonna have to pause there because I'd like to hear from him rather than about him more. So Th uh, Thupten uh, Jinpa, really a, a privilege to have you here. Please, over to you. Thank you, Shyam, for the introduction. And uh, I feel both humbled and also very happy to be included in this uh, special panel um, as part of the, you know, at the end of the three year rounds of uh, Global Health Compassion Rounds. And um, I had the opportunity to take a quick look at the synthesis that was produced based on the three years of panel discussions that you have had. And uh, I was deeply touched and impressed as well as inspired and encouraged by the how global and international the representation have been and how the comprehensive has been the dimensions that have been looked at uh, of the interface of compassion vis-a-vis -vis healthcare and particularly from the global perspective um, my own kind of role is is really kind of i suppose best described as uh, coming from the perspective of a compassion advocacy uh, uh, angle. I've been, as Sham introduced, I've been the principal interpreter for His Holiness for over 37 years. And, um, you know, one of the things that His Holiness has been really steadfast is the promotion of compassion, uh, you know. Yeah, and, and primarily kind of one of the things that he has really successfully achieved is to, in some sense, extract the language and discourse and concept around compassion out of this traditional religious and mora morality context and grounded into a kind of an understanding of basic human condition, part of basic human condition. And to that end, he had also sought help from science because science has the power to naturalize language. And, and hence my own connection with uh, Stanford initially um, as part of the Neuroscience Institute there and then so development of the CCT that Shan mentioned as well. So, um, so in a sense, what I'm trying to do is to um, do something in the service of His Holiness's, you know, kind of vision to bring compassion a more active force in the world. So the you know, founding of the Compassion Institute is an attempt to do that in practical terms, um, because compassion as a key value is universally embraced. If you look at any religion on the world, the major religions of the world. Compassion is the underpinning of all the ethical teachings. On the specific precepts, the religions may differ, but if you dig deep, the foundation of ethics, the ethical teachings is really compassion. You know, the language may be used differently, compassion, love, you know, but it comes down to the same thing. So the universality of compassion is accepted and recognized widely, but where science can really help, and this is what His Holiness was trying to do, is to strive towards a more universal language and un universal perspective, and to make compassion not just a, an ideal value, but actually a reality of everyday human condition and experience. And, and one of the things that His Holiness genuinely believes is that, as you know, Professor Grant pointed out, in some ways, compassion is not something new, but it's compassion is a new way of seeing things. Compassion is a new way of doing things. So, of course, it's hugely challenging because we are now trying to understand compassion's place within the system that is very complex, has a long history. But in another sense, I would argue it's actually quite simple. It's really kind of recasting the whole story by now using a different lens. So in some sense, the, you know, that the, at least conceptually, the task is quite simple. In practical terms, it may be a challenging one. So through Compassion Institute, one of the things that the Compassion Institute has decided to do is to get into the key sectors 
of public service, for example, healthcare, we have a program, the law enforcement and education as well. So these are three key areas Compassion Research has chosen where, you know, the compassion really has to be at the, at the interface of interaction between the service and the healthcare, you know, care providers. So in the healthcare domain, um, you know, Compassion Institute developed a specific adaptation called Caring from the Inside Out. It's primarily aimed at helping to prevent burnout among physicians. So the self-care and motivation out of the six key themes that the, you know, task rounds, uh, compassion rounds have identified, it touches upon those two key themes, motivation and uh, how to keep the motivation alive and how to help with the self-care and self-efficacy. So we have done this, but increasingly, I mean, since 2019, over 4,000 you know, physicians and healthcare providers have gone through this program at various, and through the partnership with uh, Global Task Force, um, you know, uh, Compassion Institute has also been able to offer some of these you know, programs in the federal, federal institutions as well. But one thing that we have learned from this is that uh, I think if an in healthcare system is serious about bringing compassion in a su sustained way, and there needs to be a much more systematic and comprehensive approach. I think bringing program only at the level of the healthcare providers is in some sense, a little bit asking too much um, because then the angle from which these programs are brought in is primarily from the self-care and resiliency perspective and motivation perspective. So what is really needed is a kind of a, a, a kind of a comprehensive approach where there is also a, a focus on quality care, which is the patient's perspective. And here I'm very happy that one in, in global health round, uh, compassion rounds, you've had Professor Sinclair from Calgary University, who has been actively exploring ways in which you can actually develop measures, practical measures. How would because in the end, from the patient's perspective, if the compassion is not expressed in some form, it is not real. So I think the patient's perspective, which is touches upon the quality of care, is an important one. Physicians and healthcare providers own self-care and self-efficacy. Um, you know, one of the, the, the key themes identified, I think earlier version had self-care and self-efficacy, which is probably, I would prefer that rather than self-care and self-compassion because the self-care and self-compassion are the same thing. So self-efficacy provides an ability for the healthcare providers to continue to be agent agentive. And self-care is about you know, resiliency on the part of the healthcare providers because healthcare providers are constantly exposed to another people's suffering and human beings are not really designed to be constantly exposed to acute suffering. So you do need some mechanism and tools to, you know, sort of protect yourself against it. So the other thing is, you know, in, in the six themes, there's a uh, uh, systems alignment and power those are really hugely important part of the structure and the culture, because if there is no emphasis placed on the culture and the power dynamic and the systems itself, then I think it's a bit unfair because there has been a huge criticism of bringing mindfulness in the corporate sector, because it's really in the end used as a kind of a way of asking people to be you know, not to not to kind of complain too much. You know, just 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 be you know kind of stress management type. So I think it's my request is to really look at all three aspects: the systems and structure and culture aspect, the patient experience and quality care aspect, and then the healthcare providers' own resiliency and self care aspects. And if we are able to bring these three in a systematic way that would really make a huge difference. That was something that we learned. So I'm going to stop here, thank you. Subtin, thank you so much for those really poignant uh, um, reflections. Um, and you've given us again, food for thought and certainly really focusing in on this compassion as an active force for change, which you, I think you've consistently and continuously highlighted over the years. If I may now turn to Gretchen Stoddard, who's the Managing Director at the Izumi Foundation. 
Um, and for those um, th th that may not know the Izumi Foundation, it supports programs in over 30 countries in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Uh, Gretchen has uh, a Doctor of Public Health from Harvard, a Master of Public Health from Boston University, uh, School of Public Health, and she is passionate about strengthening healthcare systems by building the capacity of local health organizations, institutions, and leaders. Gretchen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Shams. Um, I first want to say that we are so honored to be a part of this discussion and participate in this panel. And I want to thank the other panelists for their very thoughtful and insightful contributions to this, this discussion. And I love learning from everyone here. Um, Izumi Foundation is a global health grant making foundation based in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. And our mission is to help alleviate suffering through the development and support of programs that improve health and healthcare in neglected regions of Africa and Latin America. And we focus especially on healthcare in rural, remote, and underserved regions. And I want to share a little bit about what it has meant for our foundation to participate in the Global Health Compassion Rounds and the community of compassionate practitioners that we've met through this involvement. Um, Izumi Foundation is funded and founded by a Japanese Buddhist organization, and compassion is one of the core values of our work at the foundation. And we are very fortunate at Izumi to make compassion and the consideration of individuals, families, and communities the primary concern of our work. This means that while we do care about the effective use of our funding dollars and the effective use of data and monitoring and evaluation, for us, we are also able to prioritize supporting organizations that have similar compassionate approaches to their healthcare work. So participating in the Global Health uh, Compassion Rounds has allowed us to speak more clearly and more openly about our values of compassion. We've gained language and tools and context to speak more confidently about compassion to a variety of stakeholders. And I'd say we're now able to more easily have conversations on the topic of compassion or with compassion at the forefront of those conversations, which we may not have done even just a few years ago, despite compassion being one of our core values. And we hope that now we're able to enable and initiate additional conversations about compassion in our collective global work. We've also learned that there's a, a larger, broader community in the global health field who are thinking critically about compassion and its role in our work and sector. As I'm sure we've all felt at one point or another, our work can feel isolated or siloed. And so it has been a great experience to learn that there's so many others having these similar conversations and rigorous conversations around the complexities of compassion. Um, I would say that in a US philanthropy context, compassion is not a topic that is discussed often. It may come up from time to time, but it's not usually part of the mainstream conversation in philanthropy. And this gives us the opportunity to question why compassion is not often embedded in current philanthropic conversations, um, especially when we're talking about philanthropic practices. Maybe this comes up in the philosophical concepts of philanthropy, but what does it mean in our practices? Um, I think also being part of the Global Health Compassion Rounds uh, discussion has encouraged us at the foundation to review our foundation's compassionate funding practices and processes and our relationships with our grantee partners. Or how as a funder, can we be a better listener? How are we acting with empathy and humility? How are we communicating effectively so that we're not unintentionally exacerbating the challenging power dynamics that are inherent in grant making. And I think these conversations and these actions are acts of compassion in philanthropy. Um, we've also been able to turn internally uh, to look at compassion in our own organization. In previous conversations we've had with the focus area for compassion and ethics, we've talked about how it's often easier to have compassion towards others than towards ourselves. And I think that we see this at an organizational level for us as well. It's very easy for us to approach our external relationships with compassion, 
to, with, to our grantee partners and their work and be compassionate towards what they're doing. But when we look at the practices and culture within our own organization, are we truly practicing organizational self-compassion? And what does that look like for our organization or for other organizations? Uh, so many of the conversations we've had with within our organization have been inspired by the unique conversations that have been stimulated by the Global Health Compassion Rounds and, and this, others in this community. Um, I know there's a lot more to say, but perhaps I'll, I'll end there. Uh, but we're very grateful for the invitation to participate today. And we look forward to the ongoing conversation and, and Q&A um, within this great community. Thank you. Gretchen, thank you so much. And, and each of the panelists, I'm pretty confident, could be speaking for 90 minutes and we'd be still listening attentively. So this is a remarkable set of panelists, and I'm, I'm sure everybody would agree, just some beautiful and poignant reflections. We did want to make sure that some of the perspectives of those that are, are participating in this Global Health Compassion Rounds were also shared. Um, and uh, my colleague, uh, Hali, from the uh, focus area of compassion and ethics is going to share with you a few of the reflections that have come through while colleagues have registered. So, Hadi, uh, the floor is yours on that one, please. Hi, everyone. I'm just about to share some of the reflections from our registrants. So, we had um, a bunch of people answer some of the questions that we had, and we're very thankful for everybody who did so. We found that we actually have one third of the attendees in this round are actually first timers, so welcome to all of you. And everyone else who has previously attended, welcome back. Thank you so much for coming. And we just like to highlight first that we have had registrants in this specific round from 31 different countries, which is amazing. We're starting, continuing to expand globally and we're hoping to, for our audience to only grow. Give you a second to just look at the varying countries we have. And so what, the first question that we asked was that if you had attended a Global Health Compassion Round previously, what keeps you from coming back? So what keeps you coming back to our rounds? So after reading through everybody's responses, we've summarized it into these quotes. And we found that many of our panelists really enjoy the, our audiences really enjoy the diversity of the panelists and how they share their experiences, how open they are about their personal experiences. They like to join in order to gain new insight and knowledge about compassion. The richness of the content really brings them back and how we've also touched on compassion metrics, how our panelists are incredibly engaging and innovative, how it inspires individuals to be more compassionate, how it even creates direct relevance to their work, and how this is surprisingly, well, actually not surprisingly due to um, how we approach compassion, how it's the only known forum for them to discuss compassion in healthcare, and we'd like to expand this. So, our next question was, if you've attended a Global Health Compassion Round previously, have you applied or shared any of what you have learned? So after summarizing um, our registrants answers, we found that a lot of teachers will share what they've learned with their students, as long as along with their colleagues, they have shared it with national, state and local services, which is great because that is applying to all tiers. And they've also applied it to project proposal planning. And um, some of the topics that they've shared include compassion metrics, compassionomics, as well as using it for interventions to improve working on conditions for healthcare providers. And James, if you'd like to go ahead. Thanks very much, Hallie. And really, those are important points to highlight coming through from the registrants. Um, one of the things that I've been asked to just comment on uh, just briefly before we come back to the panel is some of the linkages potentially between our work on quality of care and primary health care as a whole. Next slide. Um, let's uh, think back to why we were doing this in the first place. And this is from the Lancet Commission's work on quality of care, um, really emphasizing that there's a really strong mortality case 
for efforts on quality of care. These were estimates that 8.6 million deaths per year in 137 low and middle income countries are due to inadequate access to quality of care. And we can see that the access side and the quality side, quality of care um, is responsible for the majority of those deaths. Next slide. And that is where our director general made a very clear linkage between compassion and quality of care and highlighting that you can never take quality for granted and that compassion is a critical element of that consideration. Next slide. Um, if we think a little bit around each of the areas that we have examined and so nicely synthesized within the synthesis report and described by David, there are very strong linkages, and some of those linkages are actually not as intuitive as one would imagine. We've seen even in the reflections, compassion and faith is clearly coming as a clear linkage point, compassionate leadership, palliative care, all of these areas require attention. But next slide. But let's think a little bit around the future and the primary healthcare work. Um, before our Director General, Dr. Ted Ross, came in as our Director General, this, these were his words. We must urgently reorient health systems towards primary health care as the foundation of universal health coverage. And interestingly, at its heart, primary health care has a commitment to equity. So here again, we're seeing some of the reflections from our panel coming through in his words many years ago. And accordingly, he says, he will enhance our focus on the least served, most marginalized populations. And this is uh, something that he said as he was being elected as director general. Next slide. He's kept to that commitment and WHO has moved forward very clearly alongside UNICEF on developing technical work on primary health care through the release of a operational framework. It's not about frameworks. And as again, we come back to the core compassion as part of our DNA. But let's remember that systems for improving the quality of care is one of those levers for change. And you can see that there are multiple levers for change that we can, of course, go into details. But those levers include things like primary healthcare workforce or physical infrastructure, all the way to purchasing and payment systems. So these are deeply technical areas of work. I would highlight that compassion and the compassion lens can be applied to each of these. Next slide, please. If we are looking at the primary health care approach, it's a whole of society approach. So it's not just primary care, but it's primary health care approach. The declaration of Astana, the vision for primary health care has made that very clear. And of course, each of the aspects of the primary health care approach, whether that be the focus on community engagement and empowerment, or the focus on integrated services with a focus on primary care and public health, or multi-sectorality between different parts of government, all of those aspects have compassion as a possible entry point. Next slide, please. Let's remind ourselves again that we have come to these Global Health Compassion Rounds right from the beginning, three years ago, using this triad of awareness, empathy, and action. And we've put it forward that this needs to be applied at all levels of the health system. At the point of care, health worker connectivity, health facility level, district level, national level, and global level. And we've heard from our panelists today how those interconnections might play out. Next slide. And just reminding ourselves that we are moving towards the sustainable development goals. But as we heard from Liz, that's not the end in its own right. We as human beings have a role to move beyond the sustainable development goals with all the troubles that we have as humanity. Um, if we can take the slides down, I'd like to come back to the panel. Um, the panel has been inspiring today. Um, Sharmin, your transformation call for health systems. Liz, your insistence on looking at what could be. Isha, your 
very passionate plea on equity, Zubtin, the incredibly important point of compassion as an active force. Gretchen, your absolute clarity on the fact that you've gained language that is required to advocate and bring compassion to various areas. These are all critical points. And of course, you've made many more points. I'd like to turn first uh, to colleagues to see whether you'd like to be able to reflect very quickly on anything that you've heard from another panelist that's made your piqued your interest and you've thought, I really need to say something on this one. And if I may, I'll start with Liz to see if anything that's been said by somebody else that you wanted to pin, pinpoint and highlight. Liz, to you and then coming to Sharmin. That's challenging because almost everything that everyone said was so relevant. Uh, and I think, so I want to stand back and say that what struck me was the knitting together of the different themes because uh, I heard repetition of those essentials in what each of us said, and that is the heart of compassion as well. But Jimpa, maybe I can pick up something you'd said of, around the, um, the, 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 the beauty of, of moving forward, of not being caught up in feeling that we can't do this because it's something out there. It's actually something internalized to us. And I think all but each panelist almost brought that through. Super, Liz. And th 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 this is exactly, we've highlighted many points, but highlighting is the mirror of a mirror. Uh, so thank you, Liz, for getting us started. Sharmin, if I can turn to you, and then I'd come to Gretchen. Okay. Uh, actually, a lot to share, but uh, I'd like to add with Isha. Uh, she has mentioned really um, very uh, important issues to add uh, in the future of um, Global Health Compassion Round to address. And with that list, I feel I would like to add a few more, like uh, disability area um then she has mentioned about the eco justice i mean more about uh specifically um it was actually in my list as well health effects of climate change and i would like to add the digital health which is evolving very rapidly and we hear about the human centered design prototype development and digital divide is enormous so I feel uh, these are other areas could be added on the list. And Great we can, coming. oh, yeah. That's fantastic. That's what we're catalyzing mm -hmm. for the future. Gretchen, if I can turn to you and then come to Isha for a poignant points, uh, Gretchen. Yeah, thanks there. I think maybe our two things that I uh, jotted down that I wanted to make sure I talk about with, with our team. Um, one, uh, was uh, one of the quotes from Jimpa. I think you said something along the lines of, if compassion is not expressed, it's not real. And I think this goes a lot with our conversations on what is compassion, what does it look like? But if we don't turn that into some sort of action within our foundation, then, then it's not actually a compassionate act. And I think that's something for us to keep in mind. And the other um, piece that I think I, I wanna follow up in conversation, um, is something Isha mentioned around um, it's not thinking of someone who is suffering and someone who is providing alleviation of suffering. And it's that we're all together in this um, and have we're equally privileged to be a part of this process. And I think this is important in philanthropy because it is so often thought of as someone who needs something and someone who gives it. And we try to talk about our collective humanity and what this looks like, and we're working towards the same goals, but there's that inherent struggle. And I think this concept speaks to that in our discussions on compassion. Thanks. Very nicely put, Gretchen. Isha, anything that you heard from others that you wanted to really pinpoint before turning to Thukten? Isha, you'll need to uh, unmute, please. 
Yes, I think every point made by each panelist are critically important for transformative reform of the system. Each one of them as a whole. Again, going back to my interest in the deep space exploration, I keep thinking that the first telescope already gave us a rich data on the astral bodies. So the successor, the web, could go further based on that rich data, but exploring each entity in, within deeper levels, exploring the complexities of each item, like we have talked about motivation. Now, if I put it in uh, the lens of equity, again, motivation for the marginalized, motivation for the patient to be engaged, motivation for the professional to be engaged within this, with the system, all these give us variations. So in that sense, I would think that the rounds have already given us very rich data. As I see it, now in the 2.0 version of the rounds, we can go into deeper analysis of this data and their intersectionality, their interactions. So that's why I, I respect, I have learned from each one of you so much. And really, I, I, I don't know, I'm so grateful for this participation Isha. opportunity. Thank you. Isha, thank you so much. And deep space exploration. I mean, you, you, <laughs> we can visualize that immediately. Um, uh, Thupton, I'll turn to you. But before that, I just wanted to make um, a, a question to, to, to David for him to think a little bit. Uh, just it's the R R Rachel has asked a question, how can we take concrete steps towards a praxis of compassion within global health systems? And maybe I can turn to you uh, on that one after reflection from Thupten, uh, please. Um, thank you. I feel really humbled because the panel is composed of um, you know, colleagues who have really done a lot in the real world. <laughs> I am more at the level of kind of thinker. <laughs> um, and so I feel really humbled, but also uh, one thing that really struck me is the uh, the multidimensionality of this whole question and of challenge of bringing compassion into the global health context, the gender equity that was in, important raised, point raised, and also the the power dynamics. Um, I think that's a very important one. And uh, one of the things that I keep hoping is that uh, healthcare providers, when you know patients turn up at hospitals, nobody wants to be there. So, and the people are turning at a very vulnerable point in their life. So there is a power disparity in that relationship and just having some awareness of those. So I just keep thinking that perhaps some of these are kind of specific tools that could be probably brought into the training of care providers quite early so that we don't wait until late. Um, and, 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 and many of these are not that, complex you know if we can just add a bit here and add a bit there and you know in liz very you know beautifully pointed out it's a new way of looking at it so if we can somehow find a way to bring the lens of compassion into the training itself and also the beauty of compassion if you experience it you know this is the most powerful expression of who we, we are as a human being and when we experience it we feel great I mean, that's in who wouldn't want to feel great. So I think those kind of more poetic dimensions somehow need to be conveyed. And I also take the point of the challenge of finding nuances in the actual. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm a kind of a universalist at heart, you know. I mean, I've often have debates with my daughters who are very critical of universalism. But I do believe that, you know, some degree of universality is unavoidable because if we are biological creatures, you know, everyone is vulnerable to pain, disappointment, sadness, you know, fear of death. There has to be certain universals. And I believe compassion is one of those at a very, very fundamental level. Now, the cultural expressions may differ. So that's where I think the nuances come in. So I think there, I think having a help from, you know, and, and Professor Sinclair pointed out, 
when we're developing metrics, let's not be too Western centric. Let's find a way to include expressions of compassion from the other cultures as well. So that I think is an inter interesting tension, but I wouldn't want them to believe that compassion is more culture specific. You know, I would want to preserve because if suffering is universal, then compassion has to be universal. <laughs> there are no two ways about it. So, you know, I, I feel really encouraged and, uh, you know, I would really like to personally thank um, you know, the global task force for being taking on the leadership role and collaborating with WHO in kind of, you know, steering this very important kind of, you know, uh, uh, initiative. And, and I hope that, you know, some very practical protocols will come out of this so that those systems where they're in seriously interested in bringing it um, will be able to be put into practice. Beautifully put. Um, thank you so much, Tipton. Um, if I may come to David for this uh, really important um, mother stream, uh, uh, upstream question on how we can take concrete steps towards a praxis of compassion within global health systems that was posed by Rachel Hall Clifford. Uh, David. Thanks, Sham. So I'm glad that Rachel asked me how do we um, take the steps rather than what are the steps, because I, I think uh, that may be a more challenging situation. But I think what we need is, first of all, to move outside of our comfort zone, to be able to ask the tough questions. Our identities are tied up in this wonderful enterprise called global health, and we don't like to look at areas where we're not um, succeeding or where we fall short. So we need to have the courage to move beyond our, our comfort zone and also we need to, I'd say the second thing is we need to move beyond our silos. We're really, global health has a very powerful central role, but it's, into, it's so intimately connected with so many other systems. And we've learned that particularly during the COVID pandemic. So we need to reach out to colleagues in economics, in social science. Uh, we need to grapple with these fundamental challenges of diversity the lack of diversity, the inequities, the power structures. We, we talk about these in global health and we're committed to them, but we often work within our own silos and we need to broaden that base of collaboration and thinking and design about how we move forward. The third element I would say is that we need to both be practical on the one hand, um, and that theme has been uh, emphasized, and we need not to lose ourselves in the mechanics of, of systems change and uh, delivering services. So how do we hold this paradox of the centrality, the, the, the innate humanity of compassion, why we're doing this with the actual mechanical details of implementing them? We need somehow to hold both of them. And then the fourth thing I would say is we need to recognize that we need each other in order to do this. Um, none of us can do this alone. None of us can um, sustain the motivation given these huge challenges alone. And so we need to lean on each other, support each other, to share our stories and to see this as a communal enterprise. So uh, what are the specific actions that flow from that? I guess that may be the topic for another discussion. We may also be able to jump into some of those um, issues during our 30-minute uh, compassion lounge immediately following uh, the, the rounds today. We've added that feature. Anyone who would like to stay on to continue the discussion uh, is welcome to do so and we'll elevate all of the attendees to panelist level so we can have a conversation. Thank you, Shams. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Um, we recognize that there is never going to be enough time to be able to uh, unpack all of the richness that we've uh, been able to start unpacking. So the Compassion uh, Lounge would be a, a great opportunity um, for us to continue this discussion. Um, I did want to just, uh, before handing over to David to, um, to close us out, just mention a couple of points from, from my side. So these three years have been actually incredibly special. Uh, we've, we've taken a pathway with openness and what we have tried to do, and we've succeeded in some ways and we failed in others, is to explore openly. 
And if you notice from all of the recordings, as well as the report outs, there have been some controversial areas that we have not been shy to explore. So the first point is, let's think about the counterfactual universe where we didn't have a global health compassion rounds. What would it have looked like? And uh, from my side, just listening to the wisdom of colleagues over a period of three years has an, been an incredibly enriching experience. And it's given me some ammunition, um, and I shouldn't use the word, military terminology, but it's given me ammunition to take into global health dialogue. Second point is often the people that are at these global health compassion rounds are the last person standing in a room of those that are saying, this is all nonsense. And I, just to be able to just say that openly. Often there's the, the work on compassion can actually be greeted in various ways. And while we are in this safe space, it's worthwhile uh, acknowledging that often we will be in a room full of colleagues that may say this is way out there and it doesn't need attention. So that community and that actual strength from being able to share with like-minded colleagues makes a difference. And it's made a, a huge personal difference in my professional life. Um, and then the final point is related to 2.0. My strong uh, suggestion or inclination would be for us to move on the work related to compassion, recognizing the big ships that are moving towards SDGs. So that's something that we really should be thinking about very carefully and recognizing that those shifts happen regularly and for us to be quite clear about how we shape those uh, discussions so that we can fit into dialogues and have the maximum level of influence. Because of course, the intention of all the colleagues is to make sure that compassion is not just DNA, which it is, and I totally agree with colleagues who have mentioned that compassion is absolutely a part of the DNA. And Liz, you've said it so eloquently, but then translating that DNA into protein is what we really need to focus in on. So with uh, humility to be able to listen to you all today, I wanted to just thank uh, also the, the FACE team over this last three years. It's been a phenomenal journey. The Global Learning Laboratory team at, the, at WHO has learned so much from this interaction and it's an absolute privilege to work with you over the last three years. David, for you to close, over to you. Thank you, Shams, and I want to thank you for your leadership at WHO and, and in uh, really shining a light on the importance of compassion in global health. Um, and also thank uh, our teams both at the Glo Global Learning Laboratory and at FACE for the incredible work that's gone into this to making uh, these three years uh, possible. I'd like to thank each of the panelists today. You've inspired me and really given me some food for thought. You've given us some direction, you've challenged us and really deepened our thinking. And I, I love your um, call to deepening, Ishere, both the, the deep space, we need to go to the deep inner space as well as if we're going to transform these systems. So thanks to all of you for your um, your wonderful comments, your stimulating and inspiring reflections. I'd like to thank all of the panelists that have participated for these last three years. Um, what an amazing group of people um, and, and what an amazing community that we're starting to perceive ourselves as being part of here in global health. Uh, just a sense of deep gratitude to all of you um, for this opportunity and an invitation for any of you um, panelists, participants who would like to stay on. Uh, we'll continue the conversation very informally for the next half hour for any of you who are able to do so. Uh, so thank you so much. And um, we look forward thank to 2.0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shamin and Jinpa. Thank you. And thank you, Liz, David, Britton. I'm seeing your name. <laughs> That's a beautiful name. Thank you. Amy, all along, a guide, and Patricia. Thank you. All of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.